Welcome back to the Beyond Homo Sapien podcast. My name is Paul Tokizolu. This show is all about how you can join the ongoing evolution of humanity, awaken, and thrive. Welcome to the first episode of season 11. This episode is going to be about magic. I want to start off with a reading from my favorite book. This book is called The Doctrine and Ritual of High Magic by Eliphas Levy. This is chapter 1, page 29. Before anything else, who are you? You who hold this book between your hands and are beginning to read it. On the pediment of the temple, which antiquity had dedicated to the God of light, we read the following two-word inscription. Know thyself. I have the same recommendation to give to anyone who wishes to come closer to science. Magic, which the ancients called Sanctum Regnum, the Holy Kingdom, or the Kingdom of God, Regnum Dei, is only appropriate for kings and for priests. Are you priests? Are you kings? The calling of magic is not a vulgar calling, and its royalty has nothing to do with the princes of this world. The kings of science are the priests of truth, and their reign is hidden from the multitude, as are their sacrifices and their prayers. The kings of science are those who know the truth, and the truth has set them free, according to the formal promise of the most powerful of initiators. One who is a slave to his passions or to the prejudices of this world will not know how to become an initiate. He will never be able to do so as long as he does not reform himself. And so he will not know how to become an adept, because the word adept means he who succeeded by his will and through his works. One who loves his ideas and is afraid to lose them, who is suspicious of new truths and is not disposed to doubt anything rather than accept something at random. He can close this book, which is useless and dangerous to him. He will understand it poorly and will be troubled by it, but he would be even more troubled if by chance he were to understand it better. If you hold something dearer in this world than reason, the truth, and justice, if your will is uncertain and faltering either for good or for evil, if logic frightens you, if the naked truth makes you blush, if your feelings are hurt when your errors are touched upon, throw this book away at once, and then act in not reading it as if it did not exist for you. But do not denounce it as dangerous. The secrets it reveals will only be understood by a small number, and those who understand will not reveal them. Showing the light to birds of the night is like hiding it from them, because it blinds them and becomes for them more obscure than darkness. I will thus speak clearly. I will tell all, and I have the firm belief that only initiates or those worthy of being initiates will read everything and understand something. There is a true and a false science a divine magic and a magic that is infernal, that is to say, misleading and obscure. We will reveal one and unveil the other. We will distinguish the magician from the sorcerer and the adept from the charlatan. The magician disposes of a force which he knows. The sorcerer struggles to abuse that of which he is ignorant. The devil, if it can be permitted to use this reviled and vulgar word in a book of science, surrenders himself to the magician and the sorcerer surrenders himself to the devil. The magician is the sovereign pontiff of nature. The sorcerer is but its desecrator. The sorcerer is to the magician what the superstitious and the fanatic is to the truly religious man. Before going further, let us clearly define magic. Magic is the traditional science of the secrets of nature, which comes to us from the mages. By using this science, the adept is invested with a sort of relative omnipotence and can act in a superhuman manner, that is to say, in a manner which is not within the common reach of men. It is in this manner that several famous adepts, such as Hermes Trismegistus, Osiris, Orpheus, Apollonius of Tiana, and others, which it could be dangerous or inconvenient to name, were adored or invoked after their death as gods. It is in this manner that others, following the flux and reflux of opinion, which makes for the vagaries of success, became the henchmen of hell or dubious adventurers. Like the Emperor Julian, Apuleius, Merlin the Enchanter, and the Arch Sorcerer, as the illustrious and miserable Cornelius Agrippa was called in his time. To reach the Sanctum Regnum, that is to say the science and the power of the mages, 
There are four things which are required. An intelligence enlightened by study, an audacity which nothing can stop, a will which nothing can break, and a discretion that nothing can corrupt or intoxicate. To know, to dare, to will, to be silent. Those are the four verbs of the mage, which are written in the four symbolic forms of the Sphinx. These four verbs can be combined together in four ways and can be explained four times through the others. Magic is the original religion of the world. It comes to us from a time before history. The practice of magic has been uh, recorded and documented since the Assyrian Empire and the Mesopotamian Empire and uh, Chaldea, uh, the Chaldean Empire, Egypt and Greece, obviously, but this is something that has been with us in recorded history for uh, roughly five or 6,000 years that people have been doing magic and practicing these things and writing about it and sharing about their experiences. Uh, however, those people who did write these things down and share their experiences from the ancient world, they credited a time much older than them with uh, inventing this stuff or creating it. And at the end of the day, the overall, the overall conclusion seems to be that no one really knows where magic came from. No one really knows how humans figured this stuff out or how people got these rituals or these ceremonies that magicians have been doing for thousands of years. No one really can say exactly where all of this information originated from or what was the original source. The only conclusion is just that it is basically from a time before history. If you want to learn more about the history of magic, definitely read these books that I talked about earlier, Modern Magic and the Doctrine and Ritual of High Magic, and also check out the works of H.P. Blavatsky, notably The Secret Doctrine and Isis Unveiled. To summarize magic in a nutshell, what it is, is essentially combining uh, visualization work with movement, with different things that are happening in your physical body, and creating a sort of ritual or ceremony around it. And a ceremony could be something that lasts for five minutes, it could last for a week, it could last for a month, but it really depends on you and what you decide you want to do around your ritual, around your thing that you're doing. So someone who says that they practice magic, they re what they really mean, is they have a practice that incorporates visualization with a type of movement and oftentimes a out loud chant or a, a thing that you might say or maybe something that, uh, that is uh, complementary to what you're doing with the, you know, the visualizations that are happening in your mind and the physical actions that you might be taking with your body. The point of this is to basically activate all aspects of yourself, mind, body, and spirit, and to completely silence everything that's happening inside of you so you can stay focused on the visualizations and you can stay focused on what it is that you're actually trying to do. So magic really emphasizes focus and intention and your motive. So uh, how clearly are you able to focus on the visualization that you're trying to do? How much are you able to focus on the actions you're taking or the words that you're vibrating or chanting? And then also, what intention do you bring into this ceremony? Intention and motive really drive magic, and they differentiate what we call uh, right hand or white magic against left hand or black magic. White magic refers to magical ceremonies where the only intention is for you to connect with a higher, more supreme, divine version of yourself. Essentially, what white magic is and what magic really is supposed to be is the exercise of divinity by the human being. So these ceremonies and rituals, they they start off with this understanding that humanity is divine, that you and me uh, we are God essentially experiencing ourselves, that we are these spirits inside of these human bodies, and we are having this human experience, but as a divine being. 
So when you're doing magic, what you're really doing is exercising divinity. You're practicing that or you're remembering that. That's why magic was demonized by the church and why the Inquisition was so brutal on magicians because they operate from that fundamental belief system that humans are divine. So when you're practicing magic, you are exercising and practicing and feeling that divinity inside of you. This is the ultimate goal of white magic, is to connect you with the higher version of yourself or God or whatever terminology you want to use around that and to establish that relationship so you can feel it, you can be it, and you can exercise it here in the physical world. There's magical rituals like the lesser banishing ritual of the pentagram or the middle pillar uh, and that have, again, gone back thousands and thousands of years. These are rituals that you can practice every single day, and there are hundreds of thousands or millions of people around the world who are also engaged in that same ritual practice every single day. And that's a big part of it, is understanding that we are all connected, we are all in this together, and at the end of the day, we are all one being who is experiencing itself from billions of different perspectives. Magic, when you have this understanding that there's other magicians out there too, there's other people who believe this this way too, and we're all practicing together, it's really something that can raise the collective consciousness to a higher level and create a better world for all of us through this understanding, through this practice, this mutual, this mutual knowing of the truth. So white magic seeks to unite you with the will of God or the divine mind or the all or again kind of whatever terminology you want to use. It's meant to connect you with that. It's meant to help you receive information from the, you know, the most powerful version of yourself and that way you can have a better life. You can become a better person. You can become a better neighbor or a better father, a better family member, or whatever it is you're trying to do, magic will help you in that because it ultimately makes you a better person and it helps you to solidify these understandings within yourself. And what I believe and what a lot of magicians uh, believe is that by doing these practices that we're actually having an energetic impact on the world around us, which creates a vibration that can be felt all over the world. Again, it's not just me doing that, but every single magician around the world, it's like we're all united in this goal together to raise the collective vibration, to help everyone else, and, and of course make ourselves better in the process. So that is the intentions of a white magician or someone who is on the right-hand path. Black magic, on the other hand, is coming from a place of selfishness. It's coming from a place of trying to get stuff for yourself, from trying to influence other people or have power over other people. And it's a type of magic that is very self-harming because at the end of the day, everything that, ha that you do will have a karmic backlash. So if you are engaged in white magic and you're focused on just being connected with, with God and with other people around you, and you're trying to better yourself and that's the reason you're doing this, then the karma that you're creating in the world is only going to be good and it's only going to help you out and that's what's going to be your experience. Black magic, on the, other, on the other hand, comes from a place of causing harm to the world around you and it creates negative karma that creates this backlash that will actually cause more harm on you. The only people that I've ever met who practice black magic, they usually are very self-deprecating. They're very masochistic and they know what they're doing. So a real conscious black magician is someone who likes this. They want the karmic backlash of pain because oftentimes they're a masochist. They're in this for self-harm and they want to harm other people in the process. That's how they get their satisfaction. It's a terrible path to be on, and if you're anywhere close to it, I highly suggest you get off that path and come over to the right-hand path, because at the end of the day, it's a lot more productive, you have a much better life, and you're actually, you know, helping the world instead of <laughs> purposefully and intentionally hurting it. Black magic at its heart is something that is supposed to just serve you and only you. So it's, it's rituals and ceremonies that 
are reliant on creating an outcome that's going to help you and create a better world for you in the process. But again, it operates off of this understanding that at the end of the day, you're going to get this karmic backlash and a black magician, oftentimes uh, they're looking for that. You know, they're not uh, they're not necessarily phased by it as many people might be. For me, it's not something that I've ever done intentionally. It's not something that I've ever uh, tried to do intentionally, and it's not something I'd ever recommend you do. However, if you don't understand motive and intention, it is possible to accidentally practice black magic because at the end of the day, it's actually the same force. It's the same sort of thing that you're doing, and it all depends on your motive and on your intention. So if you're operating from a place of selfishness and ego and you're just trying to do this for you and you're just trying to manifest stuff that's maybe going to serve you and help you and you're just in it for yourself or maybe you're trying to create your, create yourself into something that you're not. Maybe you're trying to become the savior of everyone. If you are going into these practices and you don't have a pure intention and you don't have a pure motivation and you're secretly just trying to do whatever it is you're doing for ego and for yourself and you're really just trying to make yourself into something that maybe you're not or maybe you're trying to impress other people or you're trying to somehow have some sort of an effect on other people, that's when it starts to cross over. That's when it crosses over into being being black magic, being something that is not in everyone's highest good and everyone's greatest benefit. And that's why it's really important to be conscious and be fully aware of like, what is it that you're actually doing? You know, what is it that you're actually trying to do? What are your real intentions here? Are you just trying to manifest something because you're scared or maybe you're trying to get some control over people like maybe a relationship or or some person in your life or a work partner or something like if this is about other people if you have other people in mind when you're doing this and you don't have their consent then it crosses over into black magic and there's going to be a karmic backlash so it's something you got to be careful about you know you've got to really check yourself and check your motives and check your intention every single day if you are summoning up some spirit in some ritual and you're asking this spirit to do things for you that involve other people somehow. So let's say, for example, you have a business and you're trying to ask this thing to manifest you more money. That and, uh, and you don't give it any parameters. You don't give it any sort of things, you know, safety rails to operate within. Then you have a very good chance of this thing going awry. That's why it's very important to always be really clear in your magical ceremonies over, you know, causing no harm, doing nothing that puts anyone in danger, ensuring that everyone is safe, making sure that you are operating at the highest level of your own being. All of these things are super important. That's why rituals like the Lesser Banishing Ritual of the Pentagram that's why these are the foundation of a magical practice because it helps to clear the air of all that stuff. Like these are rituals that have existed for thousands of years specifically to get you into that place. So <laughs> that's the good news is if you study books like Modern Magic, you're going to learn uh, rituals like that one that, that put you into that state basically by default. So if you're going along that path and you're really trying your best to to uh, get into that headspace and operate in the right way, then you don't have to worry about accidentally doing black magic because it's almost like the universe is going to be holding your hand through that. You know, if you just set that intention that this is how I want to operate, this is what I'm going to do, and then you kind of go forth from there, then you're going to be okay. A really great golden rule of thumb that I've taken from Manly Hall and his book Magic, which is another really good book on magic, the best prayer is a prayer of thanks. So instead of asking a spirit or asking God to do stuff for you, thank God and thank the spirits and our helpers in the unseen realm for everything that you already have. Don't ask for anything outside of yourself, really. Like that's the, 
best way to go about it that I've found is magic is not about, oh, how can you manifest a million dollars? Like, no, it's about connecting you with God. And the more that you deepen that relationship, the better your life will get. And you don't have to worry about manifesting stuff outside of that. Because if you just focus on that, if you just make that your your why, you just make that your thing, then everything else will fall into place. So the best prayers are a prayer of thanks, a prayer of gratitude for what already is, is in your life. You can also design your own rituals. You can design your own ceremonies. And this is something I actually started with this. So for years, I started with creating my own rituals and my own ceremonies and my own stuff. And then I got into kind of the more traditional way of doing magic. And uh, these days I do, I do both. You know, I create my own rituals and I do rituals that have existed for thousands of years. So if you're creating your own ritual, that's really where you need to be careful. Again, like don't involve people without their consent. If you have someone's consent and they know what you're doing and they want to participate, then of course it's great. You know, then it can be extremely powerful, very magical, and it actually increases the intensity of the experience exponentially. However, if you're involving someone in any way and they don't know what you're doing, and they don't have the same level of awareness as you, and you don't have their permission, then it crosses over into black magic. This is a mistake that I have made in creating my own rituals. So uh, please learn from my mistakes. Don't involve other people without their consent, just like anything else. Consent is, is supreme in magic and in all things. You learn about the power of your consent, your consent to, you know, what angelic spirits do you talk to? What energies are you working with? What other people are you surrounding yourself with? What other people are involved in your magical practice? These are all things that you consent to. So if you give your consent to something that is not in your best interest, then that's going to have a very negative impact on you. However, you can withdraw that consent at any time and you can step back over the other side and you can realize the power of your consent by withdrawing it. That was when I really realized the power of consent was when I started to actively withdraw it from, from people or from energies or from different things that I had been interacting with. And when you start to do that and when you begin to only consent to yourself and you know people outside of yourself that you very directly give consent to, everything changes. Like You can feel it inside of yourself, the difference. It's like your energy becomes your own. That, in many ways, is one of the great benefits of practicing magic, is it grounds you in your own energy. It helps you to not really uh, feel impacted by other people as much, and it helps you to actually stay a little bit more protected and a lot more hidden energetically from people around you. So that way, uh, if you want to, you can actually withdraw your energy from other people altogether to the point where they might not even notice you're there. You might even seem to be invisible. This is something that's talked about in all these books of magic, the power of invisibility, which is essentially you withdrawing your consent from other people to even know that you are there. And then you can walk unseen. There are many benefits of magic, but really they are just the benefits that you get from connecting with God, connecting with source, the universe, the all, whatever terminology you want to use around that. But the benefits that I've experienced or that I can testify to are invisibility, like I said, divination, which is essentially being able to read the effects within the causes, being able to predict the future, but based off of intuition, based off of what you are reading and feeling inside of the astral light. When you are connected with the universal mind, you're able to get an intuition or to get a feeling about what's going to happen next. Another benefit is thaumaturgy. Thaumaturgy is having control over the environment around you through either the forces of nature or being able to manipulate energy around you to the point where you can actually tell. You can actually see it happening to the point where it's like you can control the wind or you can control the weather. Theurgy is another benefit. Theurgy is being able to communicate 
and work with the spirits that govern the hidden realms of this world. This is something to be very, very careful with. Something, again, talked about in modern magic and the doctrine and ritual of high magic is the idea of being very, very careful with invoking and evoking spirits. Again, it's something you want to be very careful of where you're giving your consent away. However, that being said, all the spirits that I've encountered and that I've given my consent to energetically and that I've worked with energetically in the past or in the present are all really have a, had a wonderful impact on my life. It's helped me to have a better understanding of myself, the world around me, and the universe. It's helped me to be a better person and it helped me to know how to best help other people. Another benefit is gnosis. Gnosis is being able to actively just know whatever it is that you're supposed to know. It's like a permanent intuition that you can always call upon to give you an answer to whatever is in front of you. And although it might not necessarily be the correct dictionary answer, it is the answer that you need to get you moving in the right direction or going in the right place might just be a feeling telling you to talk to someone that you know you're supposed to talk to or go a certain way that might end up being better or safer than another another way it might look like you setting a gps in the in the universe setting a destination and then going these different directions to get there and when you follow your intuition when you follow gnosis you're able to get to that end result even though it might look very different than you had originally planned so being able to receive that information and act upon it, that is a very powerful skill. Another benefit is astral travel. Much of magic happens inside of the astral realm. Astral travel is something I've talked about on this show before. You can go listen to the, the episodes I've done on that in the past. But uh, essentially, magic happens inside of the astral realm. So when you are practicing magic, when you're doing these different rituals or ceremonies, you're supposed to hold these visualizations of you in the astral world while you're also in the physical world. And this visualization practice is extremely powerful. It focuses your mind like nothing else I've experienced, and it quiets everything. Like when you're doing it properly, you can't be worried about anything else. Like you, you have to be 100% present for it to really work, for you to really notice any sort of actual effect or actual real things happening. You have to be able to hold that mental picture like crazy, like... Uh, like a monk <laughs> and that's really what you start to feel like when you go down this rabbit hole and you've been practicing this for a couple years you start to feel like a bit of a monk and it's fun it's a whole lot of fun and honestly that's why i do it that's why i practice it every day because it's, it's a lot of fun like it's really become for me like an anchor point or a grounding rod that i'm able to always know will be there to help me out again it's not about trying to manifest the everything you've ever wanted it's not about trying to manifest you know a new car or a new job or something like that or more money it's not about trying to create power over other people or make you more influential over other people it's not about any of those things it's actually just about connecting you with source and then watching what happens from there astral travel is an extremely powerful practice and it's a way to very directly have these conversations with spirits or explore different parts of yourself or to get answers to something that you're looking for or to just hang out. It's a lot of fun to zoom around in the astral plane and explore different planets or explore different dimensions or these things that happen inside of your mind. So magic at its heart and soul is a mystical experience. It's not something that you're supposed to be able to go and prove to someone necessarily. It's not meant for that. It's not doing these things. It's not meant to impress other people. It's not like you're supposed to have a crowd watching you as you do this stuff. It's meant to be done alone in the quiet of your own house or in the quiet of your own yard or outside. Outside is the best place to do these things for sure. And uh, connect you again with source, with the highest part of yourself. So I wanted to make this episode as kind of an introduction to what is this stuff. 
And what you'll find is that whenever you're practicing, whenever you're engaged in these different ceremonies and you're tapped in to that heightened state, it increases the vibration around you. Suddenly, things start to happen that might not otherwise happen. But they usually only happen when you're completely alone. <laughs> and it's, again, it's not meant to be something that you're going to use to go out and you know, prove how great you are to the rest of the world. It's not about that at all. So if you want to learn more, listen to the rest of this podcast, listen to other episodes that I've done about this topic, about hermetic philosophy or about astral travel or psychic abilities or different stuff like that. But the best way that you can get involved is to take a look at the books that I recommended. So Modern Magic by Donald Michael Craig and The Doctrine and Ritual of High Magic by Eliphas Levy. There's a lot of other books out there uh, around this topic. I also really like the book Magic by Manly Hall, although that one's not really, doesn't really get into the ritual side, but it's more the philosophical side of magic. But if you want to actually get involved in practicing, those are the books that I would, would direct you towards. There's a lot out there, but those are the ones that have resonated with me. Those are the ones that I believe give the best foundation, give the best knowledge, and uh, there's a lot to work through. I'm not done working through Modern Magic, and I've been working with it for a couple years, and I'm still not finished with it by any means. <laughs> so magic is not something that you're meant to master overnight. It's actually all about putting in the work every single day to improve yourself, improve your spiritual practice, and then watch as that kind of changes the world around you. And that experience of kind of how magic changes the world around you that will be different for everyone. Thank you for listening. I really hope that this helped you out. And uh, if it did, let me know what you think. Either send me a message, send me an email, or just drop a, a comment below. If you have any more questions, get in touch with me, let me know, and I can make an episode answering that question. I'm going to do my best to help people out, but I really do want to be clear that I've only been doing this a couple of years. I've encountered people who have been practicing this stuff for 25 years or longer. So those are the people that I really encourage you to study if you're trying to get into this from a ritual perspective. So again, Modern Magic is a really great book. Doctrine and Ritual of High Magic, another really great book. So there you go. I'd say if you want to get into this with actually practicing it, definitely go to them. Don't go to me. My intent with this show is to hold space for you and to really connect you with different resources and different information that I've encountered as I've been going down this path. When I encountered this information a couple of years ago, it was really confusing for me. It was really mind-blowing. And uh, when I started to actually practice this stuff, I didn't have anyone who really explained it to me like this. And it took me a couple of years to connect with the right resources. And when I did, I realized, like, again, that I was accidentally practicing a lot of black magic because I was involving other people in my rituals without their knowledge, without their consent. So this did have some karmic backlash on me. And I was able to adjust that and get out of that, get out of that phase and move into a better practice. But again, the big mistake that I was making was I was focused on other people. I was involving them in some way. I wasn't necessarily trying to do harm to them. I, was, I wasn't trying to cause any pain or suffering to them. I was actually trying to you know, help. But just by involving people without their knowledge, without their consent, that will set you up for some really ugly times because you're involving other people's energy in your magical practice without their knowledge. So again, if they have if if you do get permission and you do get their consent and you do have their their knowledge and they know what you're doing and they've said that they're they're down, that's completely different. But if you're working with someone's energy and they haven't consented to it, it's not going to go well for you. <laughs> so that's been my experience and I definitely wanted to share that. So if you're going to get into this stuff, make sure you're taking it seriously. 
to make sure that you're studying the right sources and make sure that you're checking your intentions and your motives every single day. And just that alone will change your life. <laughs> like even if hypothetically you didn't do a single magical ritual, you never looked into any of the stuff that I've mentioned, you didn't believe anything that I'm saying about any of this stuff, but every single day you woke up and you checked your intentions and your motivations and you made sure that you were listening to the right people and doing the right things, like that alone is going to change your life. So start there. <laughs> and uh, if you're interested, listen to the rest of this podcast, read the books that I talked about, and uh, I'll see you on the next episode. Thanks for listening.